Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 20th of May 2019 and joining me on this edition are Steve Withers. I'd like to make a dinner reservation for 12. And Cass Harlow. People keep asking me if I'm back. And we're back, uh, but just for this week. Uh, next week, the podcast is not around. It's a bank holiday weekend. And like we said before, if it is a bank holiday weekend, there, there won't be a podcast. We won't be recording um, on the Sunday night, so there won't be a podcast on the Monday. So next week, we're not here. We're then back again, uh, beginning of June, I think it is June the 3rd. Uh, yeah, will be the next right. podcast. So, and we've got lots to talk about uh, in June the 3rd because we've got lots of review stuff coming through and some pretty interesting stuff there. And end of the month stuff as well. Oh yeah, we've got all the end of the month stuff to do as well. So that's uh, to look forward to. Um, you'll have noticed that we are reduced capacity um, on this evening's podcast, but we also have a special guest coming along in the hardware section. That's Paul Gray. He's the Director of Research and Analysis at IHS Market, and we're going to talk TV technology. So that's coming up there. Um, right, so I'm going to go to our Steve Davis of the podcast. Steve, have you done anything interesting this week? Yes, I went to see the Manic Street Woo-hoo. Preachers. Oh, great. I love the Manics. It, in the Bath Forum, which is a tiny venue, first time they played Baths since they played Bath Moles Club in 1991. Right. Um, they were doing a, a small venue tour to celebrate the 20th anniversary of This Is My Truth, Tell Me You. So they played the whole of the album, and then they also play you know, a set of other songs as well, yep. and other hits. Yep. Um, it was really good. I mean, that small venue, they never play venues that tiny. I mean, this is like, I'm talking three, four hundred seater. Yeah, I, I've, been, I've been to one they did uh, for Holy Bible, which would have been about 10, 15 years ago now, um, at the Newcastle City Hall, which mm. again is a really intimate little venue. And it was really strange because <laughs> you are so close to them. Yeah, uh, literally, you know, yeah. twenty twenty five thirty feet away, and um, the acoustics as well. It's far better in small venues than than large venues. Um, so were they good? It's still good. They were awesome. Yeah, they were excellent. I mean, I'm not sure. This is my truth. Tell me, yours is necessarily a great album to play live. A lot of the songs are quite introspective, um, but they're just great. And uh, it was funny because I went with my friend of mine, and we went to see them play at the London Sto- London Astoria in February 1992. One of the best gigs I've ever been to in my life. It was actually filmed. You can watch that gig on YouTube, actually. Um, unfortunately, the resolution is just not there. I know exactly where I was because I was right at the front. I was right at the front. No, no. And did you I have, watched the video. Did and, you have hair? At that yeah, point? yeah. No, if you own a copy of <laughs> Most Like Lemptonous, the CD single of that, it's a gatefold. It opens out. There's a photograph of James Dean Bradfield from that gig being held up by the audience. He dived into the audience, and, and I'm holding him up, and I'm, I'm on in that photograph uh, on the single. But... Uh, um, we, we realised my friends and I as we were going into the gig there were people in the queue that weren't even born yeah. when we went to that concert in 1992 yeah, I, I, by a considerable margin they hadn't been born at that point but the crowd yeah. was largely quite old <laughs> yeah no it, it, it is see, I, I noticed like the last Mannix gig I went to and it was like uh, yeah the, the, some of them are a bit... aging with the cra- with the yeah, with the band. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love <laughs> um, to say it was a great show. I, I didn't realise they were actually touring at the moment. Uh, that's a shame. I'll have to see if there's, I doubt there'll be any tickets for anything near me. But oh no, no, the, these all went, went sold out instantly. I, I would have, like I, would have I say, so, it was yeah. uh, unusually yeah. small venues for them, and then when they play arenas. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah. Love no, it's it's been a while since I last saw them, so I'd like to see them again. Anything else? Uh, not really, no, otherwise, other than that, just a yeah, bit of work. Isn't it? But I, was, yeah, I was doing, like I think I said last week, I was doing a, an article on 3D movies, so I had to watch quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Which wasn't that much of a chore, really. No, I just was. <laughs> and uh, interestingly, it's now, um, how long have you had the JVC now? It'll be coming up to four months, three months, four months? Uh, I got it at the end of January, so it's like February, March, April, four, yeah, went to my fourth month with it now. Right, and? I love it, I love it, I absolutely love it. Um, it's uh, It's a fantastic project, it really is. Interestingly, I calibrated an N5, first time I'd seen one, uh, on Friday, and uh, it was very good. I think, uh, you know, looking at it, yes, it's not got quite the wide color gamut, it hasn't got the uh, the filter that's on the N7, and it's not, it hasn't got quite the same contrast ratio, but looking at it, I would say it would be hard to justify the extra two grand. Um, it, was, it was a very, very, very good picture. Okay. Um, so that was interesting because I hadn't seen one before. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, but yeah, no, I, I'm loving it. I, in fact, um, this afternoon I watched Black Hawk Down and it looked absolutely amazing. <laughs> 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 absolutely amazing. It's a brilliant disc. 
Well, I've got to say, that, that's a film I haven't seen probably since uh, uh, since the original disc came it out. It was released on the Blu-ray 2006. It was one of the very first well, that's Blu-rays. That, that was the last time I watched it. Then. And the disc, when, when you get the 4K discs there, it, it still it includes that release. <laughs> uh, no, the that comes actually, the last time I saw it, it was the Korean... Um, I had to import the South Korean disc because it had the DTS soundtrack. So oh, really? how, how long ago would that have been? Yeah, the, the 4K disc includes the extended cut as well as the direct as the original theatrical cut right. and the extended cut as far as I'm aware has only ever been available on DVD so that's that's the first also the, it includes all the extras so there's like two documentaries um, one by the History Channel and one by PBS about the actual mission in Mogadishu um, all the making of stuff the whole lot it's, it's, uh, it's a really good package and the Atmos soundtrack is amazing so good stuff Excellent. I recommend it highly oh, I'd, I'd... I'm going to buy discs. I'm going to leave it till the the darker nights start to come when when I uh, you know when I can start to enjoy my movies. I, I'll, for some reason, I feel guilty watching movies during the day. <laughs> I don't know why it is. It's just in my mindset, you know, it, it just feels odd. Good. I think it's it's when you go to the cinema. So somebody during, went to the cinema on Saturday morning. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, I went to the cinema on Saturday morning, and when I came out, it was like it was only two o'clock. You always and, forget that you when you've been inside the cinema during the day, and you come out and it's still daylight. You're like, yeah. Oh, it's, oh, yeah, it re- really plays plays with you. Anyway, uh, Kaz, what have you been up to? It was my son's third birthday, so it was the perfect excuse to get as many toys that I really wanted. <laughs> yeah, scale extra. Except so. Sorry. <laughs> something uh, age inappropriate <laughs> like all of the models of all of the avengers so we've got him <laughs> Do you even know what they were <laughs> yeah he's, he he loves hulk he got him hulk iron man and someone luckily bought captain america just thankfully guessed that that would be the last one i got <laughs> and uh, and he <laughs> hasn't opened thor yet so we got the main avengers <laughs> and Dude, was uh, it a normal hulk or smart hulk no i didn't get uh, none of those ones i got one from like I fished out an old toy from my childhood, which is like a giant Hulk, like a proper proper angry Hulk. No, slightly better than Lou Ferrigno, but (laughs) proper angry Hulk. None of this smart Hulk or in between Hulk. I mean, he's a he's it's a proper big toy. So um, so he's got all the Avengers, and we made him a digger cake. So so I'm I'm known for cakes for the kids. So every year they get a different themed cake. So this one was a digger cake. So it was an entire industrial site with a, a molded ramp that goes around to a top with a uh, an excavation and a crane. And uh, and they've dug out a hole, and inside the hole they've pulled out a number three. So um, we did the whole, whole excavation cake for him. And the piece de resistance was a, a metre-tall... A cantilever crane, remote controlled. Bloody okay. hell, you went to town, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, and, and I tell, tell you what, everyone knew it was for me. Like the family came round, <laughs> both sides, and I'm, I'm sitting there with a the remote control saying, What do you want to put in the bucket now, to her? and then operating it back and forth. And uh, and they were like, Who did you get the toy for again? <laughs> Yeah, well, you've just told everybody on the podcast now, so yeah, event, exactly. but, then, but then probably nobody listens to it, so I think you're still safe there, Kaz. Um, right, what have I been doing? Uh, lots of TV stuff, uh, funnily enough, and I got the uh, the BenQ came back through, so the fixed one came back through, and it started first time, so I'll get uh, looking at that next week. Uh, first world problems, TV stands. Samsung are still doing the wide TV stand for the uh, the Q70. Yeah, yeah you, that was the first thing I moaned about in the review. Oh, I did with someone else was like, you have to have a really wide apart yeah. surface to put it on. It's so annoying. <laughs> yeah. So uh, normally what I've got is a, an old subwoofer that I set one TV on and then the other TV is on the TV stand. But so it's I, bed. <laughs> I am trying. Yeah, I know. Uh, but when the lights are off, you can't see it on the video. But yeah. anyway, um, on the TV stand at the minute is the Sony XG95, which again has the wide feet. And on the XG95, and like uh, last year's model, you can't turn them inwards. Um, so they only they, they can only go one way, which is pointing outwards, and that's because of the sound bar that goes with it, or oh, the right. optional extra sound bar. So yeah. that's why Sony force it that way. So I've got two TVs that are really wide stands at the minute, and I'm trying to set them up for comparison stuff through the video because obviously, if you're going to compare anything to the XG95, you're going to compare it to the the Samsung Q70 because they're about the same price and same level of the market. You know, you wouldn't compare it to the the Q90R, for example. That would be 
completely stupid to do that. So yeah, I've been trying to find something that is wide enough and the same height so I can get the uh, Q70 sitting next to the XG95. So like you say, first world problems. interesting to hear how they compare. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to comparing them once I get them set up and calibrate and stuff. I'll probably do that Tuesday and Wednesday this week and get it all together into a video, which will probably be a week after that. Um, it's one of these things I underestimated when we started doing these videos that take a <laughs> hell of a long time to put together. Uh, and then this weekend, um, what have I done this weekend? Uh, today was uh, breakfast um, at the Toby Carvery with the Mustang gang and then we went down to Fishburn Airfield and had a lunch. So um, one of the things I'm finding is I'm putting on weight again because <laughs> yeah. a lot of the car events I'm going to uh, revolve around food and uh, American food. So, yeah, you know what happens with that. So that's what I've been up to as well. So I think we're all up to date. It's competitions next, and we've got a long list of competitions, but I think the last one is well worth winning. Um, that's not to say that the others aren't, but I think the last one's really quite something special. So Kaz, tell us all about them. Right, so we've got a slew of Blu-ray competitions. You can win Iron Sky, the com- coming race. So I guess we're starting with the bad. That closes 22nd of May. Have you seen it? because <sighs> i enjoyed iron sky <laughs> yeah this one didn't work All right. so this is this is like the low budget version of iron sky <laughs> but it does have a t-rex in it so you know you you uh you, know, you pay your money you take your choice drive special edition with the radio one soundtrack alternative for those curious about how that worked out um and then we got night of the generals eureka release that closes 27th of May. November, another Eureka release. That closes 27th of May as well. And 21st anniversary of Sliding Doors is still open. And that closes 27th of May. And Colette, which is also 27th of May. Getting a pattern here. Criterion's May titles, which we've got quite lucky with Criterion recently. We've had April's titles, May titles, and we should be booked for June's titles as well. So that includes A Face in the Crowd, my Brilliant Career, and Badlands. Then there's The Woman in the Window, which is uh, another Eureka release. That's a nice little noir. That closes 3rd of June. And The Favourite, highly recommended, closes 29th of May. And the absolute pinnacle of all of these that puts everything else to shame is an SVS Prime bookshelf speakers and SVS Prime wireless sound base. That mm. closes June the 23rd. And well worth winning. All competitions open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. Excellent. And we should have some previous competition winners because we've had lots of competitions recently. Okay, it's Bushel 44 won Cujo on Blu-ray. Alan Smith wins a copy of Squadron 303 on Blu-ray. And Virgil Tracy 123, I'm guessing he might be a um, Thunderbirds fan there. Uh, he wins Alien on 4K UHD. That is a fantastic prize. That disc looks absolutely amazing. It's one of my new demo discs for mm-hmm. testing. It's if you want to test black levels and shadow detail, the the openings of I still think it's the best opening of a film ever. Um, mm. And I was actually uh, sat with a, a producer today, a film producer, over breakfast this morning. New member to the group, and he was uh, we were actually got discussing you know pacing and that kind because of, he writes screenplays and uh, and yeah he's said you know if that screenplay went in you front wouldn't of you wouldn't do it now they wouldn't do it now because you've got to get to the the action they wouldn't take the time to to do the you know the little walk through the, the which ship. is a shame yeah it yeah. is because really it, it all shame. builds it builds um it builds tension you know the whole beginning even though nothing's happened all it is just everyone waking up but there's still because uh, of them partly because of jerry goldsmith's amazing score it's you're on edge already yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah, even the credits yeah. give so, you the willies so well done great virtual prize. tracy one two three yeah that, that is a great prize right we'll be back in a sec with our hardware section Okay, so uh, moving on to our hardware section of the podcast, and we need to introduce a special guest who has arrived to talk TV technology with us. So we have Paul Gray. Now, Paul, can you just describe what your job is, who you work for, and um, why that may be of interest to our listeners? Yeah, I work for IHS Market, and I'm a research director, and I lead our research into the TV industry, so people who build uh, and uh, and sell TVs. Um, and our, our principal job is understanding what's going on, of course, and then to forecast and anticipate 
how the TV in your living room or for sale uh, will change over the next five years. And and who is it that you produce this information for? Is this mainly for manufacturers or is this for the industry at, at large? Um, our, our clients are really wide. So, of course, uh, TV brands are uh, very important clients of ours. Uh, but also, for example, people like broadcasters, people who develop software for TVs, and indeed people who are further up the supply chain, so LCD panel makers, uh, and also people who invest in the industry because there are vast amounts of money at stake. Um, if you're going to build an LCD panel fab, you're going to be spending something like $2 billion and somebody has to lend that money. Let's narrow it in on our sector. So TV, consumer TV, where where are things at the moment when it comes to the research? What are the interesting things that you're getting back from what you're looking at in the consumer TV market? Yeah, certainly. I think one of the things that when you look at it superficially is that 4K TV is now more than half the TV market worldwide. And if you look at Western Europe, then it's getting on for 65% now. What's behind that, of course, is, first of all, consumer preference, um, that even in sizes where they have a choice, that like 40 or 43-inch people do buy the 4K version. At the same time, a lot of it is driven by the LCD panel industry, and you can't buy an LCD panel to put into a TV set of 55 inches or bigger that has any other resolution. It's 4K or 8K and that's it. Um, But the other thing that's going on is that people are buying bigger and bigger TVs and this is a long-term trend. And of course, the more that people shift to buying bigger TVs, then that takes them into the, uh, the, the part of the market that they have a choice for 4K. We were at a a Philips event at the beginning of the year where you gave a presentation and one of the things that surprised me, I I don't know about Steve, I can't talk about for Steve, but what surprised me was the fact that screen sizes are getting bigger in Europe, which is actually outpacing the US and you always assume that the US market is the biggest market and going to have the biggest screens, but that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, we've got very, very close in the past year and the reason is that the markets are now getting very distinctly different flavors that in the US um, actually the share of the market that's 32 inch for example is much higher than Western Europe and the reason for that is that in the US people have two three four five TVs in the household and there are these 32 inch ones that are very very cheap that are dotted all around the house Uh, by comparison Western Europe of course we do have smaller homes and the market is now diverging from the United States and it's really becoming about one big very nice TV in the living room and that TVs in secondary locations like for example kitchens or kids bedrooms are gradually disappearing and certainly don't appear to be being replaced. Paul, what, what's, what, do you have any data on, because when, when I was a kid for example when I was younger, TVs uh, or most consumer products, in fact, had very long lifespans. So, in other yep. words, there was it was probably I would say at least ten years before anyone would think about replacing their TV. What sort of um, turnover rate now is it for televisions? Um, it's probably about eight years. I would say that eight years has been um, roughly where it's been at over the past uh, fifteen years or so. Certainly, ten years ago, we saw that lifetime come down to about five. And is that when everyone was going to full HD. Um, that's right. Well, the, the key one was that the price erosion at that stage was really colossal. Um, as 42 inch and 40 inch, as you say, in full HD became available. And, and we saw prices fall by you know, rates like 35% a year. And at that stage, people got a lot more for their money and, and they, up, they, they had an upgrade cycle before the end of uh, the TV's life. And what we saw them doing was that they would buy a new TV and then pass the old one off maybe to uh, friends and family, or they would just demote it to another room in the house, like, for example, the bedroom. Um, So that that set lifetime in its primary location went down. Since then, of course, the market has quietened down. And what we've seen is that that lifetime has has crept out again and looks like about eight eight years at the moment probably the secondary sets are going on for much longer and really aren't being replaced at all and just run to failure so so we assume that 4k the 4k cycle started about five years ago would be my my guesstimate that means that it's another three years at least before before 
everyone has pretty much got around to replacing their primary television with a nice new 4K TV. Would that be a fair assumption? Uh, yeah, that's right. And uh, and of course, what you can then do is you can model that across households. And of course, many consumers will run their TV literally till it goes pop, which could be 12 years. And there are also people that buy new ones every year, like uh, people indeed. listen to this podcast. <laughs> I, indeed. So uh, looking at that, then I, I think by 2023, we see over half of t- TVs in, in Europe and primary TVs will be 4K. Because, of course, not all sizes are 4K, so some yeah. people are still buying 32 inches yeah. of living room TV. Okay, I, I guess the interesting thing that's happening in the market at the minute, if you listen to just the TV manufacturers' marketing departments, is 8K. Um, <laughs> so let's move away from the marketing well, departments. Well, that's what I was sort of trying to angle towards, yeah. <laughs> Phil. So, you know, if you're talking about an 8- to 10-year you know, cycle, yeah. that means that should you be pushing 8K TVs now, exactly. if it's not going to be another three years if people are looking to replace their... You know, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and that's that's where I think it is. So if we take the marketing out of it, what is the data actually telling you at the minute, Paul, when it comes to resolution? Okay, so uh, first of all, so far a vanishingly small number of 8K TVs have shipped. Um, we saw worldwide uh, under 19,000 last year, um, and, and 8K is going to remain a treat. Of course, it, it's very he- heavily... Um, Uh, priced at the moment and you have to pay a lot of money Um, I I think for us when you then say that a TV is something that you don't look at but you look through the TV at the content then 8k content is going to remain very very scarce for some years Um, there's only one broadcaster that's committed to 8K and that is NHK in Japan and and of course they launched an 8K satellite service on the 1st of December last year Uh, other people are playing around at shooting footage in 8K um, but I I think it's very different between shooting footage at 8K which gives you lots of lovely data that for when you create an edit and you can downscale it and, and it definitely looks better than just shooting in 4K but that's very different to delivering it. And as a guideline, then NHK broadcast satellite BS8K channel uses 100 megabits a second. And even if you live in Japan and Korea with amazing broadband, <laughs> yeah. then that is tough. <laughs> yeah, and absolutely. for the rest of it, it, it's beyond our dreams. Yeah. So, so do you think what we're waiting for is yet another uh, jump in compression? Uh, technology Correct. because that's that's what happened with 264 it allowed us to have 4k on a disc and and 4k over the air is that what we're waiting on now yeah absolutely and certainly the the guidance that i hear um from researchers who work in compression say that they think that using all the tricks and a new generation of codecs beyond uh, H.264, so for, sorry, beyond H.264 and HEVC, the next one, one of them is called VVC, and they think they can probably deliver 8K at around about 35 megabits a second. Um, that's not the end of the story, though. The other thing you have to remember is that broadcasters have to move uncompressed, and that is gigabits a second. And what they will probably actually do is do some intermediate compression in the in the creation chain so up to now you've had uncompressed going around studios and that um, from cameras at football pitches to the outside broadcast trucks now it looks like they've got to add some extra compression in all this is a lot of kit and it requires an investment and it requires a payback and what really isn't clear at the moment is how that will be funded um Will people pay extra for TV? Big question. Um, And especially, I think, the the issue on 8K is it's about timing. So broadcasters are just equipping with 4K. Would they wait and do 8K, which is still crushingly expensive on the equipment, or will they just carry on with 4K and expect to then uh, recoup that investment for a decade or so? And that, to me, seems much more likely. Um, and therefore, I think for um, for the rest of us, then 8K is a decade away in terms of content, if not further. 
Okay, so that takes care of the 8K question. Let's move to 4K. That is where things yep. uh, really are moving at, at the moment. So sticking with the content side of things, I have seen some research, not from yourselves, but from mm. other places, um, saying that, that users really are struggling to find 4K content. Um, what have you guys found? Yeah, there, there was something out the other week, which which I don't think is wasn't plausible, was implausible that said that only half of people have actually experienced 4K. Um, it that is, data yeah. was from the states, actually. So I think that's a little bit skewed because a lot of American, in the, in, in the large parts of America, the internet yeah. uh, connections right, are fairly absolutely. poor, so they can't, they literally can't stream 4K. So I think probably it's, the question should have been, if you could, would you, <laughs> rather than can you? <laughs> Um, oh. Yes, I think I think there are all sorts of different way, way, ways of, of cutting that question. But um, if, if you look, for example, in Europe, which is our backyard, then no public service broadcaster is offering an 8K service at the moment. So not the BBC or for, Rai. 4K, in sorry, 4K, you mean. Full. Sorry, did I say 8K? Sorry, yeah. my apologies, 4K service. Um, so no, none of the state broadcasters uh, are, are offering 4K yet. Next year's the Olympics, and they will launch it. Maybe not all of them, but very many of them. But, of course, this is a commercial event, and nobody's committing now because uh, they fear a response from their competitors. Um, so I, I think what we will see is a lot of launches next year in the run-up to the Olympics. Um, and if history is a guide, then it would be a best-of channel, first of all. Um Probably what we'll see is also a much bigger divergence in the way that people offer things. So the BBC has been quietly working away at delivering 4K through iPlayer, for example. Um, and there's lots of little treats that appear in 4K and you can get them on iPlayer. And, and whatever we see next, um, iPlayer is going to be at the middle of it. And, and, and what they're doing is understanding the loading on iPlayer and making sure the infrastructure is robust. Um, but we'll also see some more on satellite, which which will be interesting. So it is coming. I think the the key one is about impact, and broadcasters want that 4K channel to look very different to the existing HD footage, which means that it's got to have HDR with it, uh, which means it's got to have deep color as well. And that is rather different in terms of producing it to just throwing in some extra pixels and um, and splashing it up there because that really doesn't create the impact. And certainly last year with the World Cup, the response on the impact depended very much as to whether people did an HDR service or not. Paul, is there any, any talk about higher frame rates as well? Great question. If you're a broadcaster, then in general, I think that they love the idea of high frame rate, especially, of course, if you're a sports broadcaster, because sports in high frame rate looks amazing. Um, the issue at the moment is that is that essentially the whole industry hasn't got together and said that high frame rate is a good thing to do. I think that TV brands are a bit cautious because, of course, they offered 100 hertz sets for many years and really struggled to explain that to consumers as to what that was all about and therefore um, they never really got as much value out of that feature as they uh, as they thought they ought to or indeed considering the costs they invested in it so I think everybody needs to pause and think carefully but broadcasters definitely intend to do it interestingly um, it doesn't cost that much in terms of data so because of course if you're repeat if you're adding extra frames they look much much more like the frame before and the frame afterwards then what you find is that to actually double the frame rate you only get about 10 percent extra data you have to carry so for broadcasters it's a lot of impact for a relatively low data payload uh, increase that's interesting i didn't realize that i'd assumed you know there yeah. would be double the data rate but it was only 10 percent increase and that makes because delivery a lot easier yeah, because the picture changes very little between yeah, each one. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, certainly, the World Athletics Championships at Berlin uh, were shot in high frame rate last year by the European Broadcasting Union with their um, various partners. And it was the first time watching athletics that it was you could see the muscles flex on the athletes as they ran. Uh, quite incredible how sharp it was. Um, with 
the women's athletes, you could see they normally tie their hair back in ponytails and you could see the ponytail swishing. Uh, and you suddenly realize everything that you're missing uh, when you watch it at conventional frame rates. Of course, I mean, you know, 25 frames per second, 24 frames per yeah. second. We've, we've lived with that for such a long time. When you actually see... Uh, you know more frames, and and we've had the demonstration at the a number of CESs mm. over the, the recent years. Um, one that sticks in the mind was rugby. It was uh, it was a rugby game that had been shot in a stadium, which was half in shadow, half in light. It was high frame rate, but it was also HDR, and uh, and it and it looked amazing because the iris didn't have to be opened and closed on the cameras. Right. So you got to see more of the action, and it looked super smooth and super. Uh, Stable and the detail as well. You know, you didn't have the uh, the motion blur in there to right. to the same extent, and it just looked mm. great. Did look amazing. I think that was Dolby Vision that was doing it was, that yeah, demo, yeah, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So, which made, Paul, is there um because there's obviously different versions of HDR. I mean, there's HLT, which the BBC has been developing. There's Dolby Vision with offering their version, um, things like HDR 10 plus. Is there a lot of um, behind the scenes? Is there a lot of cooperation in terms of the broadcasters and deciding what they're going to do and how they're going to take it forward? Yes, I think that probably across Europe, then broadcasters are pretty wedded to the idea of HLG because right. it's it, it's simple and it works. Um, that doesn't mean that they have a, um, a specific commercial. Um, viewpoint that says HLG and HLG only. So for example the BBC um, they deliver an HLG but at the same time uh, if you buy something from the BBC that's an asset that you want in a different format they'll happily do that and indeed the BBC uh, material that you can buy uh, pre-recorded like uh, for example on disc um, I believe that's in other formats. So I yeah. think Broadcasters are saying we will use the tool that is right for the job um, rather than say we, we will use only this one tool. So I think broadcasters are quite pragmatic about this. Um, and I see an outbreak of pragmatism from increasing numbers of TV brands who say we have to be able to decode everything. The one thing we know is that a format war will slow it all up and will destroy value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the, the moves from at least two manufacturers this year, yep. I've, I've I've put paid to that. I think everybody else now has to follow. I think uh, to to keep up if the, if they will and and the series down to whether, whether they will move. I, I just want to go back to HLG. Mm -hmm. Did either of you catch the uh, FA Cup um, on the iPlayer in 4K over the weekend? I didn't actually realise it was in. I should have thought about that. I watched it on broadcast. Did you? Um, All right. Yeah. Uh, Paul, did you catch it? No, I didn't. No, I, I have I got to say, haven't realised that either. But um, uh, but they, <laughs> I, I've got to say, it looked absolutely amazing. Um, obviously, they, they did the World Cup last year, and I, I, they used that as a test bed, basically. And you could tell from game to game because they were playing with the compression settings and they were playing with uh, different things to see what people would notice and what, yep. you know what what the feedback would be. Uh, compression was spot on. The uh, the the color was what stood out, and I think they've used this occasion just to play about with the wider color because it it did look what, the noticeably. blue of the Man City shirt, it, and that it, sort of it, yeah, with Watford's yellow, and, oh, and, Watford's and it yellow, really yeah. it really did stand out, and it was really really impressive um, compared to what I've seen in the past. What, um, what frame rate do you think they're using on that? Is it twenty five or fifty p? I believe it's fifty, but. Um... They probably, if you, if you're seeing it on iPlayer, you probably got a, got two versions of it that are available as part of the adaptive streaming. So there's probably 50 at the best, and then a whole load right. of other things okay. in between. Well, and, and the interesting one on this is, is is what their compression strategy is when you if you are starting to um, get choked on on bandwidth available as to what they turn off first. And I think that. In all cases, what people have discovered is that you keep that high dynamic range as long mm. as possible. Yeah, because that yeah. works on any screen size. Yeah, and it works yeah. on any resolution. You still get that wow feeling where your monkey brain inside says, "I'm looking through this screen. I'm not looking at it." Um, and, and the screen has that kind of jewel-like uh, feel to it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, so just to wrap up um, mm. on, on this section, hopefully we'll get you back throughout the year, uh, probably towards the, the end of the year, if that's all right, Paul, just to yeah. get a catch up of where the industry is. But for the, for the si- next six months, um, we're heading obviously into the traditional quiet period because there is no major sporting event this year. Right. Um, but where do you see things moving in the next sort of six months up to uh, Black Friday? I'm going to sum it up with one word, and that is bigger. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The, the the key one is that uh, we've got a lot of manufacturing capacity coming on stream in China, which is optimized for very large screen sizes, so 65-inch and 75-inch. And you saw just before Christmas that 75-inch broke the 1,300-pound mark, which to my mind is when the mass market suddenly switches on the consumers walk past and say okay yeah that's what i paid for my tv 15 years ago um and it, it, it's thinkable and suddenly then by the after the year turned we saw 75 inch at 999 and, and this is an entry price and you know it's not a heavily featured set but even so um and, and of course everything else has to fly in formation so 65 inch comes down and 55 um we're now going to try out really with consumers and see how uh, responsive they are to moving even more furniture and putting in a possibly a 75 inch tv so it's one almost as big as a door um and we keep always asking about how much bigger consumers will accept um so this year i think in the next six months is we really see these mecca large sizes being tried out in the market and we'll see what consumers yeah. Uh, thing and and we will see some I- incredibly large sizes at very very um, acceptable pricing. What about the, what about the other way, Paul? Uh, especially with OLED TVs, one of the biggest uh, comments that get made on our forums is why can't I buy uh, an OLED in uh, forty nine fifty inch? Yeah, and the answer is that um, uh, OLED is made still um, only in one factory um, and you have start off with a very large sheet of glass and you chop it up into smaller uh, sizes which are the panels and essentially running these smaller sizes doesn't tile out neatly on the uh, on the panel you get a whole load of wasted glass and what you actually th- realize is that at, at that stage a 50 inch costs exactly the same as a 55 inch because the rest is just a bit of wasted glass as an offcut on the side um lg display has a new fab coming on um, we're quite cautious because it's in a new location and there'll be a learning curve with it and, and everything's bigger. So w- we're, we're holding cautious on our forecast. They could make 48 inch on it. Um, and I think in, in Europe, that's a very interesting size. And, and it, as you say, we'll see what consumers do at the other end, which is how much they're prepared to trade size for um the, the OLED type, type image. I, I think I think it's a commercial decision by LG Display as to how they price it, and they will be mindful that with LCD getting very cheap in very large sizes, that that pushes prices down for other ones. And and I think the question is how much extra consumers would pay for a 48 inch OLED compared to. 40 49 inch or 50 inch lcd when that will be, be be becoming very very cheap indeed it's been really interesting talking to you uh paul because obviously this is the side of the market we don't always get to see um and it's always interesting to hear what what comes back from your research um so thank you very much for your time on the podcast this week and Thanks, hopefully we'll we'll get you back q4 to talk a bit more ahead of ces yeah looking forward to it thank you very much thanks paul thanks paul Okay, so always interesting uh, to talk to other people in the industry that look at it from a, a slightly different perspective than we do, Steve, and interesting yes. to, to hear things there. Now, uh, a couple of industry news items we need to cover before we go to movies. Um, the first one is Marantz have uh, said farewell to Ken Ishiwata. I, I don't know if that many readers uh, or listeners would know Ken. I think Ken's more of an industry figure or certainly has been through the time I've, I've uh, bumped into him 
in well, how long have I been doing this? 16, 17 years. Um, and, and you've spent time with him as well. Uh, yeah. Really, really nice gentleman and really Lovely knows man. Yeah, and really knows his stuff. stuff. He, he been, does. How long was he there? 40 odd years? 41 I years, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's been there since the 70s. Um, always had the same ponytail and outfits and scars. <laughs> Yeah, a, a real character. And, it was. And it was. Kim was the one that came up with the idea of the special editions, wasn't it? Where he. Yeah. But they, I think originally they they had some CD players that they hadn't sold that weren't selling, and they were going to scrap them. And he said a couple of thousand or something like that. And he said, "Listen, don't do that. Don't do that. I'll. I'll uh, I've got an idea." <laughs> and so he basically tweaked them. Yeah, you know, called them special edition, and they sold out. <laughs> <laughs> completely about yeah. a week or something like that and that and thus was born the special editions that they've been doing at Marantz ever since um, so that was his idea his baby is he retiring I mean he's pretty old it, it, was, did, it was quite leave? it was a bit vague on it that was one, a bit wasn't vague it? yeah I've I, I read I something that says retiring, uh, it would have just said he was retiring yeah I, I think uh, it said mutual at some point and when mutuals mentioned it's usually part of the <laughs> way so. <isn't. laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah I, I guess with um as we're going to talk about in a second, Sally United now owning Denon and Rants. There's been various changes in terms of management. Quite a lot of people that we knew from Denon and Rants, DNM as it was, DNM Group, but prior to the Sally United buyout, which was what, I think two years ago now, um, have gone. Yeah. So uh, I, I guess it was inevitable, weren't you? But, uh, but having said that, he's, he was definitely well into his, was he 70? I mean, if he's down from the yeah, 70s, he, he will be. Yeah, he'll be. Uh, he'll be touching. 70, so yeah. he probably, yeah. probably was around retirement age anyway. So, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's a shame to lose him because, like I say, he was a his, character. Uh, demos were always a high point of yeah. uh, various press trips, weren't they? With his massively towed in speakers. <laughs> yeah, and and he would never um, turn you away if you wanted to go and ask him a question. Yeah. Um, whenever he was more than happy to spend time with you and explain anything that you wanted to know. And and uh, there's very few people like that left in the industry now um they certainly go back as far as ken does and and it's as knowledgeable as ken is so yeah it, yep. it's, it's a very sad. nice guy very yep. nice guy. a so, legend genuine legend in the industry yeah so we wish him all the best for the future um right and like i say we mentioned sound united um taking over dnm um as happens with with these things when uh like like you you need it steve there's suddenly too many bosses and too many management levels and so on and things have to be trimmed um they have just or are certainly in discussions in taking over onkyo and pioneer uh now onkyo pioneer came under the onkyo umbrella was it last year the year before two years um, ago two years ago so um this is yet another um acquisition for them <laughs> to sound united so that means they'll have Morant, denon onkyo and pioneer and you've got to wonder um, is there does one company want four well, different see, brands they're, they're doing the same thing? Yeah, exactly. They're different brands, but they're all making the same product. Yeah, they make AVRs. So, I mean, they make other things too. But I mean, yeah. if you think about what do you think about primarily when you think when you hear those four names, your first thought probably is is AVRs. Um, now you could have made a case for I think with with Denon and Morantz, Denon's very much been the AVR part. Yeah, and there's been a push towards Morantz doing more of the hi-fi. Yeah, um, and that yeah. kind of made sense. Yeah. But Onkyo and Pioneer, I mean, that's straight up AVRs too. And I don't see the point of having three competing AVR brands under the same company. No. So, so, so you have to look at it as a possible IP buy. And, and there, I think the strongest brand there is Pioneer. Um, uh, yeah. Pioneer is a, compared to Onkyo, certainly uh, for Western audiences uh, like ourselves, um, Pioneer is the bigger player, is the bigger name. And uh, I, I haven't read completely into it, but I am assuming that this is only the AV and audio side of Pioneer's business. I don't think it would cover the players. I'm not 100% sure on that, though. Um, you know, Pioneer's a, f- a much bigger company than that. They make drives, optical drives, all that kind of thing. So I'm not yeah, sure if, it, if that fits in. But anyway, like like you say, it's it's four big brands all under the one roof. Um, I guess the, the the obvious question is which which one disappears, or are they going to split it up into IPs and have um, the different companies focusing on different things? Like you say, Marantz is more hi-fi and and AV, but with a hi-fi music musicality blend blend and I think what they might see them doing is is yeah, like you say finding the areas where they say maybe Onkyo might be strong in say headphones so yeah. let, let them do headphones pioneer strong possibly in other things like multi room products let them do that AVRs with with Denon hi-fi with Rants something like that would make sense what I can't see any point in doing is you know putting out four different AVRs under four different names um, that just means you're competing with yourself I mean if you think about it after, apart from the four names we just mentioned, 
you know, who else does AVRs? I guess you've got Arkham and Anthem, um, Yamaha. So it's well over half the AVR market. Yeah. So it, it is definitely an interest in acquisition, and and obviously um, it, with the two with Onky and Pioneer joining up two years ago, you've got you've got to wonder which IP it was that they wanted, and I suspect it was Pioneer that is the IP that they want there. So it'll be interesting to see how they carry that forward and um, and what comes of it. And and as happens with these things, um, I just hope that there's not too many uh, job losses on the back of it. Which is, well, which is always a side it's effect. Be quite a few with this, with this I think, because you know when you've already got Denon and Rance as well, there's a yeah. lot of overlap there at a managerial level, particularly, um, and sales level as well. I guess. Yeah. You don't need that yeah. many sales teams. Yeah. But Sound United, I mean, that, how big are they now? They've got so they've got Denon, Marantz, Onkyo, Pioneer, Definitive Technology, uh, Polk, and I think something else too. Um, uh, yeah, the names escape me. Yeah, is it Boston it. Acoustics? Is uh, that Boston, one the... yeah. Boston yeah. is one of them, yeah. Yeah, so they've got they've got a pretty big <laughs> portfolio big, big portfolio. of... Uh... Yeah. Almost as big as Samsung's, because, uh, you know, Samsung have been buying up a lot well, of audio they brands. They bought the Harman, 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 Harman Group, yeah. So. That's Arcam, yeah. Harman, Lexicon, quite a few things there. Yeah, yeah. so uh, so that's what's been happening in the news, and um, we'll come back with some reviews next week, because we're all busy working on not stuff. Next week, not, not next week. Oh, yeah, not next week, because we're uh, well-remembered. So, yeah, uh, beginning of June, we'll be coming back with what we've got coming up for review, what we've been looking at, and we'll have some reviews to talk about and stuff uh, in the next podcast. So that wraps up the hardware side of things, and we'll be back in a sec with the movie reviews. Okay, uh, movie review time, and um, I was hoping that all three of us had seen John Wick Chapter 3. Um, two of us did. I was supposed to see it on opening day, and uh, I was just too busy I just could not go on the Wednesday evening which I was kicking myself when I went to the Metro Centre on a Saturday morning to see a film it was absolutely and it was a rainy day as well so of course on a rainy day on a weekend everybody goes to the Metro Centre so it was hell but it was quite a packed screen that I was in uh, I don't know about you Kaz how many were in the screening that you went to yeah it was it was packed it was opening night so All right, yeah, it, was, it, would be packed, yeah. it was absolutely full yeah um Right, so where do we start? I've, I've got to say I wasn't a huge fan of two, so I loved the original film. Second film I thought was really quite good, uh, but it was very repetitive. And if you'd seen the first film, it, it was just a continuation, and there wasn't anything that really kind of stood out over the original. And of course, the, the smash up the boss um, three or two, which was <laughs> heartbreaking watching that. And uh, and it was a, a cliffhanger at the end, and it set up quite nicely because you think, well, how the hell is he gonna? How's he going to do this? And obviously, chapter three is it, it, it literally starts right where you finished in chapter two. Um, straight away, you're, you're straight back into it, exactly where he is. And uh, I'm not going to spoil it plot wise, but I have to say, it wasn't the same yet again for the third time around. Um, lots of people get killed. Um, but I've got to say, they really, st- I don't know what you thought, Kaz, but they really stepped it up in terms of the choreography, fight choreography. There was a lot more in camera fight choreography as well. So none of this fast cutting away to make it look like the actors were doing certain moves, but obviously cropping in and cutting away and, and stuff to make it. It was actually, some of the sequences were one long shot in camera, which I thought was just. <laughs> astonishing to watch to be honest with you Halle Berry wasn't quite up to the same as Keanu but Keanu's had a hell of a lot more experience at doing this kind of thing but she was still cool and, and her character and obviously she has two dogs and I've got to say um, yeah absolutely stunking um, if you've seen the trailer you know what I'm talking about there and so I don't consider that a spoiler really the only thing for me is I felt the pacing wasn't quite right I just felt there was a few points in terms of the beats of the movie where you kind of stopped for a bit of exposition where you didn't really need it and it kind of slowed it down a little bit. I liked the the plot. I liked the way that they uh, were trying to get around the problem. Obviously, there's plot holes there. It's it's not taking itself seriously. And that was another thing. I never stopped laughing all the way through, especially through the fight scenes. Some of the things that they get up to is really quite original. And I was a proper belly laughing. It's just so over the top, brut- brutally, you know, bloody and all the rest. I mean, how it got a 15, I do not know. <laughs> So for me, I came out with a big smile on my face, even though there are issues with it. There, there is a few things with it, with the pacing that could be improved. Um, but it's a John Wick film, and they've stepped up uh, again. The less I say about the final third, the better, because I want to save that for people. Don't want to spoil anything for people. But yeah, I I think uh, well, I, I'm actually a huge apologist of the second part. 
I I, uh, I love John Wick. I didn't discover it at the cinema. I I found it out on a uh, home disc, and I I don't know. Maybe the home disc this was even released before the uk cinema release I, c- I can't remember but i that's the first time i watched it and absolutely loved it and i enjoyed the second part i thought they did quite well to develop the kind of sandbox of the continental and the gold coins and the underground assassins i do agree that that they had some interesting plot angles which didn't always work but some of the action was phenomenal and in this third part, it, it does the same thing. It just develops it further. And some of it doesn't work, but a lot of it does. And it is an excuse to show some some of the best action sequences you've ever seen. As you said, Phil, they, they film long takes. And, and it must be choreographed to hell to get those takes in. Like the, there's, uh, there's just some superb set pieces where you you just go wow and it's still going um yeah i I think uh highlights for me would include throwing knives and (laughs) uh, that was just unexpected and everyone's seen wick on a horse that was a lot of fun um some of it makes a doesn't make a jot of sense and some of the motivations really don't bear consideration but it's got a lot of throwbacks to other films and you know the matrix reference and all, all kinds of cool yeah. things got some fantastic moments in it and i think that despite any flaws you might normally associate with these kinds of movies there aren't better action movies than yeah this. I, I this, totally... this series of films is is just phenomenal in yeah. in terms of the action genre it just doesn't get any better i i fell in love with the universe because it is an ob, ob, completely absurd you know there's this just this, 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 but the thing is it's uh, no. Was it originally a graphic novel? No, that's no, no, the thing. Totally no, original. So it's, it's totally, totally original, original. But the but thing it's is, like a graphic novel, yeah, yeah, the thing is, and I really noticed it with the cinematography this time around and the color palette and so on. Maybe it hasn't hit me in the face as much as it did in Chapter Three, but I just thought the cinematography it, it, it looked anime at times in terms of the colors used, the settings, the you know shadows and all the rest of it. Absolutely phenomenal, and I love the I love the world, even though you know it's it's like this. You're in a public space and uh, somebody gets killed, uh, yet none of the public even notice it. It's not as if it's like they're, they're almost invisible. You know what I mean? And I love that aspect of it. I love the you know, underworld that, that's in the open um, and everybody, everybody knows everybody. It's I really enjoy that and I, I really buy into that. But I can see why some people would be distanced with that kind of thing and, and think it was absurd. Um, but yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Right. Um, so score wise, I'm going to give it a nine out of ten. I gave it a nine. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. Right. So, uh, films opening this week. We're actually going to do films opening over the next two weeks because obviously it is uh, half term coming up. Um, and again, bank holiday on Monday, so there's no podcast coming along. So we're going to cover a few that are coming out over the next week or so. So um, uh, we're doing tons about. So um, first one, Aladdin is coming out twenty uh, second of May. Um, I I just. <laughs> There was a lot Got of neg- no there was a, there was a lot of negativity <laughs> no about the first trailer. There's now some um, critical response coming out saying actually it's not too bad, but then <laughs> it's never going to live up to the original. Um, you're never going to live up to the original genie, no matter how good Will Smith is. You know, he, he just he, unless he takes it completely a different way, which I don't think he's going to do. Although it's interesting that Guy Ritchie had an input into the screenplay, so maybe it's not a direct lift of the Disney traditional Disney film or the animated film. Maybe the, it does deviate a little bit. I don't know, but mm, I don't know if I'll go to the cinema to see this one. So anyway, that's out 22nd of May. Uh, also out that day is Steve? Rocket Man, the biography of um, Elton John, obviously. Directed by Dexter Fletcher, who stepped in to finish off uh, Bohemian Rhapsody when um, Brian Singer got fired. So he's got a bit of form here. I've read some initial reviews that apparently, incredibly, uh, considering it's based on the life of Elton John, it's not very, it's not, it's a bit boring. Yeah, that's, is, that's what I've been reading. Staggering. Well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you think, uh, how, how could you mess up something yeah, like an Elton, Elton John, John biopic? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you could possibly by playing it too safe. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Yeah. I think they don't answer, you know, they, they don't really get to the heart of Elton John, the now, man, now is the real he, person, as opposed to the public persona. Is he involved in the production, Elton John? Yeah, he, he's mad. Yeah, well, you're never going to get the truth, are you? Film. Yeah, you're not, you're not going to get anywhere near Well, he's been Elton fairly John's. honest about his uh, his life um, in the pub in public, so um, you think maybe this was a chance for him to sort of, you know, 
warts and all. I mean, there's stuff about, you know, drug addictions. They do address his, you know, his drug addictions and alcohol addictions and this sort of stuff, and obviously his homosexuality. But, I don't know, it just somehow it just wasn't made into particularly... It's just played it too safe in terms of its graph, you know, its narrative structure. Yeah, which is a shame, because it looked like it would be good fun in the trailers. Yeah, it did. And uh, one abiding image of Elton John I have from, uh, from his very popular period was him going through HMV, or was it Tower Records in London, and buying every single laser disc he could get his hands on. Um, that was, it was just, oh, wow, I wish I could go in and do something like that and have the money to go and do stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it, it, what a character. You know, what a career, what a character. And if it's as it's, it's dull as the scene, then it's a bit of a shame. I was going to go and see it, but I think I'll, I'll wait. Maybe get it on disc or something yeah, later. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the one, I know the one Kaz is looking forward to, Kaz. Secret Life of Pets too. yes. I've been <laughs> uh, watching Secret Life of Pets with the kids, getting them all ready for the return tour. Uh, yeah, I'm quite looking forward to this. I think Kevin Hart does a good job in it. Uh, I think it's got an odd style in that uh, actually it plays better with its strange little montage segments where individual scenes are hilarious but like ongoing stories are less engaging but we'll see whether the second one like manages to flip side that and make a more interesting ongoing story that's that's yeah that's what i'm looking forward to this week not sure about aladdin you see i'll wait until everyone Mm. else has seen it yeah i i guess if i was going to say if i get bored but i've got too much work to get bored over the next two weeks, I don't, I don't even think I'll use up on the Limitless anyway. The week after that, because we, we, there, there is no podcast, um, we've got two films coming out on the... Tw- well, we've got one coming out on the 27th, one on the 29th. Booksmart, I saw a trailer for this. I, I don't know if you have, Steve. It actually... I've never heard of it. No? Um, it looked really sort of... Um, I'm trying to think of what it reminded me of. What was the one with the um, the last that gets pregnant? Is Juno? Mm-hmm. It had that kind of vibe, but it's kind of over the top comedy. Directed by Olivia Wilde, is that the yeah. actress who was in House? House and mm. Tron oh. Legacy, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So Billy Lord is um is Carrie Fisher's daughter. Isn't that's she? right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So so yeah, it looked it looked actually quite entertaining. It's probably not something I'd go at the cinema to see. I think maybe watch it on a streaming service when it eventually comes to streaming service. But um, it looked entertaining enough from the uh, from the trailer. Um, and the other one, yeah, again, I was in the screen and I had an extended look at the new Godzilla. Yeah, uh, I wasn't interested in Godzilla, but having seen the extended trailer, I'm actually quite keen on it now. Yeah, I am as well. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised. seeing any trailers. I'm going to be there day one. I'm I'm happy. Godzilla, lots of other monsters. Uh, I get that the last one wasn't perfect, but um, but I've got a lot of time for Godzilla. I, I think they're just going with big dumb monster movie on this yeah. occasion, Carson, but it just looks so, yeah. it just yeah. looks so over the top that it's worth. I mean, just in the extended trailer, the sound mix was mm. phenomenal. It was better than the movie I was in to see. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was great. So yeah, I'm up for that one. I'm... And I've got to I've got to wipe the palette after seeing Emmerich's Godzilla. I've got to review that. Um, oh, I like that film. I, 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 I do like, as well. I, I actually like, mm. like the Emmerich Godzilla. I do. You know, what, I've, got, I've got a lot of time for fun. some of it. But it's got nothing I to do think... with the Japanese Godzilla, but that's fine because I think Godzilla, you know, that version's silly. It's fire-breathing, radioactive-eating yeah, giant thing. I don't mind it that it's it's new. I I, I don't have a huge amount of time for. Broderick in it. I like John Reno in it. And I don't like ultimately the way they deal with Godzilla, like final act, the way they deal with it. I don't think I, I'm much more pro Godzilla. So mm-hmm. I like the way they've dealt with him in other movies, like the more recent movies, like an unstoppable force rather than just a, a menace jaw style blow him out of the water. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that's more the grudge I have against it. It's a really well-made disaster movie, but I don't think they should have gone that angle with Godzilla. He's too cool for that. And then you've got uh, Man's Square Garden sequence, which is just a lift of Jurassic Park, really, is yeah. the Raptors. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wonder where they got the inspiration for that. Uh, so anyway, that's the movies coming out. So Godzilla's 29th of May, so that, that, that's a week on Friday. Uh, disc time, 4K disc releases. We've already started talking about Godzilla, so that's coming out. Um, have you seen it yet, Kaz? Have you actually got the uh, the preview disc? No, I haven't. It's going to land as this podcast goes out, hopefully. Okay. I have got it. I was planning on watching it tomorrow. All right, so it's pointless asking what it looks like then. Unfortunately, yeah, I haven't seen it yet, so I can't tell what it's like. But so I am watching it tomorrow. 
Okay. Uh, what else is out 4K, Kaz? Uh, Glass is also coming out, which is the conclusion to Shyamalan's... Un- tr- tr- trilogy that nobody knew was a trilogy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, yeah, trilogy that nobody saw coming. So uh, Unbreakable, which is like 20 years ago now, and then Glass. No, yeah, yeah, nobody no, expected split. that. I'm, oh, sorry. sorry. Split. Yeah, Unbreakable, yeah. and then Split. Uh, and uh, I suppose by now we're okay with spoiling the fact that Split is linked to Unbreakable. I think actually, I think everybody knows. Nothing else really is spoiled anymore yeah, now. No. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know camp. it at the time when I when I saw Split. I was like, "What? Wow!" Because nobody knows until the last two minutes. There's yeah. no there's no way you can guess that. I, you kind of uh, avoid so, it now. So, I mean, I, I haven't seen it yet, but yeah. <laughs> even I know. <laughs> yeah. So so I I was really looking forward to Glass, and I heard mixed reviews so i put off seeing it at the cinema and then i saw it at the cinema and enjoyed it i i i it's not it's not as good as i would have hoped for coming off the back of split and unbreakable but it's far better than the mixed reviews that i heard i i, I there was a lot of satisfaction there a lot of typical twists and turns and it's good seeing all of the returning stars i mean it's the first time i've seen willis and in the cinema for God, years since the last Die Hard movie, I think. Yeah. You know, so um, so yes, I I I did enjoy it a lot. So I'm I'm looking forward to checking out the 4K release of I've that. I've already um, I got the US disc, so I've seen the 4K disc, and uh, it's very good. It's 4K DI. Um, the use of colours in it is quite imaginative because um, he deliberately pushes the colours, the primaries in a comic book way when the characters believe that they're comic book characters. Uh, superheroes, and then when the psychiatrist is trying to convince them that they're not, he deliberately tones down the colours to make it more like the real world. Right. Um, it's got a great Atmos mix too, so it's it's a really good disc, and it's, it's quite nice. a film. It's not quite because it largely takes place in one location. I felt it felt a bit. I know he financed it himself. Maybe it felt a little bit small scale for what was meant to be this coming together of all these characters. But uh, yes, it was still quite clever the way he deconstructs the comic book heroes and villains. Yes. Right. So, right, so let's move on to uh, Blu rays, Kaz. Okay, we got Badlands, Criterion, the, re- the review for that's up. That's Malik's debut, which is a, it's a phenomenal directorial debut. He, he did a great job with that. And hopefully he'll come back from his <laughs> last Fortunately, three his last meandering. Few yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, considering this is how he started. Anyway, well worth checking out. And as we already mentioned, there's a comp for that. So try and enter that one. Woman at the Window, Film Noir, Eureka, uh, Edward G. Robinson, uh, Femme Fatale, getting him to inadvertently murder someone. I mean, it's it's worth your time as well. There's a, and uh, there's a comp for that. Beautiful Boy, which is Steve Carell. Um, and, and Timothy Dean, Chalamet, isn't it? Yeah. So... Um, Dealing with parental woes, there. Addiction. I won't. Yeah, I will. Uh, we'll leave that to play out. But it's supposed to be good and very good performance from Corel. Um and based on, I think, on a semi-autobiographical story, I believe, yeah. from the yeah. directors or writer-directors behind it. Is it a father-son team, Steve? It's based upon two books: one written by the father, one written by the son. Right. Okay. So. Yeah. So yeah. you get different perspectives on the same thing. Yeah, so that's supposed to be good. At Eternity's Gate, that's uh, Willem Dafoe does Van Gogh um, aiming for the Oscar. It's supposed to be very good. He didn't get it, but it, it's... Uh, <laughs> he didn't even get nominated. <laughs> no, but uh, I mean, uh, it's that kind of flavour, and, and it is supposed to be very good. Um, Mary, Queen of Scots, so that's Sorosi Ronan and... Well, like Robbie goes ugly. Yes. Can can she? Yep. Is that even well, possible? Well, it's not a great period for showing off looks, is it? It's a great period for <laughs> wigs. So uh, yeah, depends. Depends how you like your wigs, I guess. Uh, Mary Queen of Scots, Lancaster Skies, and Six Three Three Squadron round out the Blu-ray discs this week. Uh, on streaming, there's the Rene Zellweger series. What if? like a psychological thriller. I don't know a huge amount about it, but I know that only part one is coming to begin with. Um, So that's, I mean, it's her first big foray into TV, I believe. And um, so it'll be interesting to see what to make of that. Uh, 
and that's all we got coming up so uh, lots of discs out there lots of films coming up over the next uh, couple of weeks as well um, streaming wise I'm surprised there's only one thing coming on streaming or, or is Netflix still doing the oh, old... I'm, you know what I'm sure there's loads of things because on Friday I noticed a whole bunch of things pop up on Netflix finding uh, announcements for releases on Netflix and Amazon it's just the bane yeah, of my life you know it's, it literally it on the day it pops up that this is available and and most of it is your average netflix original because it wouldn't get released any other way kind of production um but some of the slightly higher profile titles get this kind of release and uh and it's really hit and miss i mean but the best thing that you can currently watch streaming and i don't care that people are going nuts over game of thrones it is chernobyl i mean i'm not saying forget game of thrones great get that out of your system but watch Chernobyl. It's it's uh it's you would never expect <laughs> it to be it? this good. It, you'd never expect it to be this good. It's not just a documentary yeah. about a disaster from the eighties. I mean it's just it's phenomenal viewing. Really, yeah. really well. You done. know something is good when you're out with a, a, a group of friends who have no interest usually in films and T V and all that kind of thing, and even they are talking about it and raving about it. Yeah, yeah. it's really good. It's riveting. It's really it's it's it, it feels there's such a lack of gloss and glamour and uh, it doesn't feel exaggerated at all it's the simplest of things utterly terrifying so it's uh yeah it's a phenomenal phenomenal tv well worth checking out for anyone who hasn't already cottoned on to it being well worth checking out yeah so uh the last bit of news really on the film front is that disney who've obviously just completed their purchase 20th century fox have announced not all the films they're going to be releasing over the next eight years but a lot of the big titles are going to be using. So, um, first of all, they have pushed, they announced various Marvel, so there's two Marvel movies coming out next year, and then three a year for the next three years, I think, after that. Um, what they haven't announced yet are any titles, So, but I think people are assuming next year's films are going to be Black Widow um, in the and May the slot, and the Eternals in the later in the year slot. Um that's that's the guess anyway at the moment. But they've announced that. So obviously we, I mean, no one thought they were going to stop making Marvel films after Endgame. Clearly they were going to do more, um, and they've laid out quite a few over the next few years um, for Marvel. They also announced, having said only a few weeks ago, they were taking hiatus from Star Wars movies after Rise of the Skywalker at, uh, in Christmas. Um, they've actually announced they're going to be doing uh, Star Wars movies on 20 sec- 2022, 2024, and 2026. Um, and they've announced just in the last couple of days that it's Benioff and Vice. So the guys that are doing Game of Thrones, or just finishing Game of Thrones now, uh, I will be doing this new trilogy, not Ryan Johnson. So as far as I'm aware, his has been shelved. Um, I can't just... imagine he's planning something for 2028. Um, you know, that's 10 years away. So It is interesting how... Lucasfilm, who were bigging him up before the release of Last Jedi, and he, he's you know one of the best directors of his generation, and all the rest of it, and 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 now there's no mention of him. You'd have to be insane to give that guy a trilogy, given the bad. I mean, after the, the bad word of mouth and bad will that followed um, Episode Eight, and then the disaster. I mean, you can't say it's just you know because of because of um, Episode Eight. Obviously, there were other factors involved, but the fact that Solo lost money, actually lost money. Um, you know, they they knit the lots right on episode nine, and I can see why they would want to take a little bit of a break. Um, and but yeah, I mean, if you're going to pick someone to do your trilogy, it's not going to be Ryan Johnson. It's going to be Ben Affleck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, although uh, actually, oh, the say, say, the saying that because of well, I, I was just going to say, I, I mean, I don't follow Game of Thrones or, or, or anything like that. Um, you would have, but, I, but I've, I've been picking up on the fact that it's not quite as good as people thought it was going to be. Well, no, it's just that it's gone a different direction than people may have may have wanted it to. Um, but yeah, it's fair enough. Um, also, they've announced there's good, obviously the Mandalorian TV series is coming at the end of this year on Disney Plus. Plus, they've announced um, they've already announced the Rogue One prequel series, and there's, there's going to be another series. They haven't announced what it is yet, but there will be a third Star Wars series I've on got, Disney Plus. I've got to say, Mandalorian. I, I'm oh, actually wait, I'm really forward looking forward, forward to this. <laughs> yeah, I, that's I want the to see main it. reason I'm going to get Disney Plus. Uh, so again, anyway, that's uh, Star Wars and Marvel. That's all lined up. They also announced Fox films that are already made um, or in production for next year. Um, Going forward after that, they'll they'll tone that down quite a bit. I just want they'll, they'll probably just use the fox, um, the fox name for perhaps more adult content than you would under Disney or Marvel or Lucasfilm or Pixar. They've also announced untitled Pixar movies going forward. The interesting news is that they've announced 
the dates for Avatar. So Avatar 2 has been pushed back a year. So that's now 2020, 2021. Uh, which means Avatar 2 will come out 12 years after Avatar. And Avatar came out 12 years after after Titanic. So Cameron needs to pull his finger out. He's not done much in the last 24 years. He uh, And then they're doing so 21, 23, 25, 27 for the four Avatar movies, um, which I guess they are committed to them still. Uh, we'll obviously, we'll have to see how the first one does. <laughs> I know he's shooting two and three simultaneously, and then there's this period of break, and then they do two, four and five, depending on how two and three go. Uh, I'm curious to see whether there'll be any demand for an Avatar movie 12 years after Avatar came out. I just can't see the interest in, in more Avatar. I, d- I don't know how they've left let it get this long and how he's let it get this delayed. It's just I, I would just I mean... love it if Cameron did something original, something completely new and different again. Yeah. He's been locked into this. Well, it's not it's not even just new original. He could give us, you know, True Lies in the Abyss on Blu-ray, couldn't he? Or you know, he could. He well, could, that would be could, yes. That would be a nice start this you year. Know, like, you're yeah, you're he not could, too busy, Jim. You've got a bit of extra yeah. time now for Avatar. So can you give us the Abyss and uh, True Lies? It's been a bad week for him really because he got Avatar pushed back. He lost. Um, you know, um, Endgame overtook Titanic to become the second most successful film ever, ever worldwide. And then a guy went to the bottom of the ocean, went deeper than him. So. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he's having a bad week. Poor old Jim. Yeah. Poor old Jim. I'm sure it'd be all right. More Star Wars, more Avatar, more Marvel, more Pixar, um, and Disney just owns everything now, doesn't it? Really. So. Uh, yeah, but yeah. I, I guess if they have Fox, though, it means that they will be working on um, home releases for the original trilogy. I've um, I've read that they have been working actually on on this for some time now. That that um, even though they didn't own Fox, which limited well before they owned Fox, they were limited in terms of when they could actually release it. Now, they, like you say, for now that they own Fox, and that means they also completely own Star Wars now, which they didn't before, because that was still owned by Fox, not by Lucasfilm. Um, they own Star Wars, they own everything. They also can uh, distribute whatever they want whenever they want. Um, and they have been working on 4K restoration, so they've already done the the, the the original trilogy. Actually, wasn't a difficult part. Apparently, what I've read is they've been struggling with the prequels, particularly two and three, which were shot at 1080p. Um, uh, you oh know, yeah, yeah, they were shot on that Sony camera, weren't they? Video those, yeah. on those Sony cameras in 1080p, and apparently that's where they're struggling, um, trying to create decent quality uh, new 4K. Well, not, obviously not 4K. It was never shot at 4K. They can't do it at 4K, but to try and create something that's going to stand up in the modern 4K HDR world is where they're struggling. Yeah. I would say, don't bother releasing the prequels. <laughs> just, just do the original trilogy. I was, I was just thinking. I was just thinking. I just want the original. In fact, I just want Star Wars. Oh, I want the original trilogy and, and, as and they Empire. were originally. Yeah. And we not get that. Having said that, uh, as someone highly pointed out to me after a previous comment on this, at one of the previous podcasts, um, check out Star Wars 4K 77. A group of fans got hold of a 35 millimeter print. They scanned it at 4K, 16 bit. They've cleaned it up. Um, they color corrected it. They've uh, done a DNR pass as well, and it looks absolutely stunning um and it's the film as it was literally because it's a 77 977 35 millimeter print it is the film for 77 exactly as you would remember seeing it when you saw it in 78 in the case of the uk so i put it on a couple i got it got it off the internet it's a big file you've got three different versions of the um the cleaned up scan uncolor corrected 80 gig <laughs> there's a uh, the color corrected version of 70 gig and dnr version is about 50 gig but um i watched the color corrected 70 gig version on the nkv file on the big screen at home and uh, it was like being sat in that cinema again in 1978. I absolutely loved it. <laughs> really? Quartz and all. And, and, everything. It was just brilliant. I loved it. And knowing how bad your internet is, that must have taken you a I've month. I've got to do it for me. All oh, right. Okay. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to take you a bit they've a month. A, they've, got hold, they've got hold of a very high quality 35mm print of Return of the Jedi, which they've already done. That can be downloaded as well if you want to. Um, apparently it looks awesome. I, I didn't actually bother with that yet. And they are currently working on a 35mm print of um, Empire. So there you go. If Lucas won't do it, then the fans will do it instead. Yeah. And have you seen uh, the fan-made final uh, lightsaber battle um, from A New Hope that a fan has gone in and completely redone? Uh, no. I'll, I'll, I shall send you a link then, because it is really, really impressive. I mean, obviously, completely changes the whole um, ending of, of any, well, the end of Ben Kenobi anyway in, in uh, A New Hope, but it's it, it lifts the lightsaber battle up to a standard that... Um, is more believable. Not, not two geriatric blokes having at each other with a couple of um, yeah. fluorescent tubes. <laughs> yeah, it, it, they have lifted it up and obviously introduced some more force powers that obviously 
you know hadn't been invented at that point. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really quite interesting to see that, and it's intercut with the original film as well. So um, I'll send you the link for that. It's, it's quite entertaining to watch. I mean, I, I don't want them to go and do that with the original films, but it's entertaining to see how fans um, can can work on stuff like this, and uh, and because the technology is there now for anybody. Yeah, 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 it's amazing, isn't it? What yeah. what people what people can do now, and with, with quite you know off the shelf. Um, software and um, I also I love the fact that Lucas said you know back when the special editions came out that's it the original versions will never be seen again this is what you have to watch from now on and the fans said no f*** you <laughs> there <Yeah>. we go <laughs> we'll do it ourselves if you're not going to do it and we'll do a better job actually because yeah. I'll tell you what I, I compared my 4K Star Wars you know the one I downloaded my friend downloaded I compared that directly uh, with the Blu-ray and um the amount of detail wasn't always better on because obviously the Blu-ray was taken from a scan of the camera negative, but the color timing's way better, um, and some scenes were more more detailed and some scenes weren't quite as detailed. Obviously the effects weren't as, as tarted up as they were on the Blu-ray, but yeah, it, it looked better in many respects, and certainly the color timing was significantly better than it was on the Blu-rays where they did muck about with the color timing something chronic. So uh, yeah, there you go. If 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 if, if the if the studio won't do it, then the fans will do it for them. Yeah. You know, you can go and make your own movies now. Yeah, if you don't like things, like you could go and do well, the Last there's Jedi. A there's a petition running, which is ludicrous. There's currently a petition. I think they're up to a million signatures. A petition for them to rewrite and reshoot season eight of Game of Thrones. <laughs> really, has it one, got that half, hard? Yeah, yeah. There's a petition. You know, I heard about this. A petition no, with a I've million been, signatures. I've been, sta- I've been staying away from it because I've, I'm only up to episode. Th- three and I, I'm going to take a break and then bosh them all um, well, well, but after I, tomorrow. <laughs> I, yeah but, I, but um, I mean it's, I've taken the break for the like, like the last few weeks and then and then we're there but I've stayed away from any press related to it because I didn't want to know what was uh, well yeah there's been a, uh, a big a big fan backlash but yeah the idea that, that HBO are going to rewrite and reshoot it is ludicrous so it's like just yeah. uh, okay yeah. just live with it you know get over it yeah. it's just a TV series but, uh, yeah at the end of the day that's the internet in 2019 isn't it yeah. it's really it's, it's <laughs> I don't like this I'm a snowflake I want you to change yeah, it, yeah, I, it. Want want it. <laughs> I want to complain and on that <laughs> no that's it for this week. Um, <laughs> complain all you want. There's a comment section. Go complain. We don't care. We're not rewriting or re-recording. No, we're not. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't live up to expectations. <laughs> Great. It rarely does, I should imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's it for this week. My thanks to Kaz Harlow. Do I look civilised to you? And Steve Weathers. May I suggest a drink, sir? And don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Bookmark avforums.com for latest reviews, news and videos. Plus, why not leave us a five-star rating on iTunes, but only if you enjoyed the show. Also, head over to, and check out our YouTube channel for videos of the latest product launches and reviews. And while you're there, why not subscribe? I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for listening. And we'll see you again next week. No, no, uh, no, you won't. No, I'm Phil Hinton. Thanks very much for listening. And we'll see you again on the 4th of June. No. <laughs> 3rd of June. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm Phil Hinton. Thanks very much for listening. And we'll see you again Monday the 3rd of June, I think. <laughs>